Good evening. In today's lesson, we're going to take a look at imperialism, uh, particularly American imperialism and some of the causes and consequences. So our goals are to describe the three reasons for American imperialism, to describe the early American approach to imperialism and subsequent shifts in policy over time, describe the impact of the Monroe Doctrine, explain how the United States justified their imperialist policies, and describe territories acquired by the United States in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So a lot of stuff. Let's get going. So to start out, we're going to talk about the rise of imperialism. So how imperialism came to be. So the first thing I'd like you to do is to tell me what is imperialism and why would a nation want to turn to imperialism? Uh, list your reasons why this may happen and just what you can think of from what you've read and what you know. All right. So if we Take a look at the definition of imperialism. Imperialism is just generally extending control over territories, and there are three reasons for this. Number one, economic. So as you're a nation, if you want to expand your nation, you need lots of raw materials, especially in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the, the era of the Industrial Revolution. And simply put, at a certain amount of time, the United States ran out of raw materials, uh, or didn't run out, but they could use more. And so they need other territories for their raw material. In addition, they also want to sell stuff to these new markets. So it's not just about getting their materials, but once we make stuff, once we make all this cool industrial stuff in the United States, we want to we want to sell this stuff to people in other countries so that we can make more money off of it. So the number one reason for imperialism is economic. It all comes down to money. Um, we can talk about other reasons, but at the end of the day, economic is the number one reason. Number two, military. Uh, we want to show how militarily powerful we are. We want to show our military might. In addition, we also need ports and we need um, fuels, refueling stations uh, as a way to show our military might. Uh, so for military reasons, we want to expand. And finally, the third reason, political reasons. Now we can talk about this as being cultural superiority, this idea that Americans felt like we were better than everybody else. Now, really at the end of the day, the, the, it's more about economic and military, but uh, to feel good about ourselves, we talk about cultural superiority. And we, by the way, don't use the words superiority. So if we first look, uh, the United States isn't the only country in the world that's imperialist. Last year in world history, you probably learned about the scramble for Africa. Uh, really, by 1914, very few places in Africa are actually independent. There's only two of them, Ethiopia and Liberia. Other than this, Europe has pretty much taken over most parts of Africa. So Europe has taken over places. Japan, they are imperializing. The Japanese have taken over uh, parts of China. They've also taken over parts of Asia as well. And so as the Japanese are imperializing, as they are taking over more areas, uh, this is another way to expand power. So America, being one of the great countries of the world at the time, or at least the nation on the rise, we want to be great too. We want to imperialize too. We want to take places over, um, but we'll, we'll take a slightly different approach than say the Japanese or the Europeans will. George Washington in his farewell address uh, really warned against the idea of imperialism. He thought that America should focus on America first. He said, the great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is extending our commercial relations but to have with them as little political connection as possible. What Washington understood is, from an economic standpoint, it makes sense to trade with other countries, but on the same token, we probably don't want to try to take them over. Uh, let's not get too involved in their politics. And he thought that trade, of course, was good with other countries, but, but he also warned about what he called entangling alliances. He thought that if we got too involved in imperialism, then we would get stuck going to war with or against other countries, and that's not a good thing. So George Washington's advice was to for America to remain America first, and that's really the approach that we took in the early days of the United States. And then we kind of sort of changed our mind, ish, and the key word is ish. Uh, so does the United States need colonies in the late 1800s? Explain why or why not using evidence and examples. All right, so let's take a look at the United States. Yes, we need colonies. We need colonies for these reasons we've talked about before. We are in an economic boom. We've got the industrialization. We are the leader, or if not the leader, we're one of the two leaders in the world as far as industrial revolution goes. As our economy is booming, 
we want to make it even bigger, better, and better than everybody else. And so in order to do that, we need to take over other countries, or maybe not necessarily take them over, but we need to open up new markets so we can sell all our stuff. We've made all this stuff through the Industrial Revolution. We've sold it all to Americans thus far. Now we want to sell it to people in other countries. So the number one reason for American imperialism, economic. In 1823, the United States made a very, very, very bold move. We issued what was known as the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, the Secretary of State, James Monroe at the time, eventually become president. Uh, he warns Europe that they should stay the heck out of the Americas. And by the Americas, he meant North and South America. He said, look, you can do whatever you want to do in your part of the world, but when it comes to the Western Hemisphere, when it comes to the Americas, North and South America, that is for America only. Because even back in 1823, James and Monroe understood that the United States was going to need to expand if we were going to expand our economy. Now, this was really just basically bluffing. If Europe really did try to do anything in North or South America, at the time, there's probably not a darn thing the United States could have done about it. Our military was relatively weak compared to the Europeans. We didn't have much of a navy. Our army wasn't that strong. We were struggling just to survive as a nation on our own. So we're kind of lucky that everybody kind of followed the Monroe Doctrine without us actually having to fight for it. Had one of the European powers actually challenged us on the Monroe Doctrine, well, then that may have been a problem for the United States because we probably wouldn't have won that war. So that takes us to other reasons for American imperialism. Uh, of course, as we've got new machinery, as we've got the Industrial Revolution, our productivity is going up, our production is going up, but we still need materials. We still need raw materials. Um, not only that, but we've also got all these extra goods that we're producing. So we're making all this stuff, and we need somebody to sell it to. Uh, we, we need to make sure that we can create more jobs for Americans by selling our goods to other countries. Uh, we, of course, also need those raw materials, especially things like rubber and tin at the, the turn of the century. Those are two of the most popular products that we need to get our hands on. And so if we're trying to expand our markets and we're trying to get the raw materials we need, we need to imperialize. We need to try to take over other countries. From a military standpoint, from 1883 to 1890, uh, the United States was in the process of expanding our military. We were building these huge ships, which the Germans called dreadnoughts. We called them battleship-class ships. Um, they were essentially ginormous steel-hauled ships. Remember, in the late 1800s, a lot of the early ships are still being made out of wood, and now all of a sudden we're starting to use steel. We're getting these big, bad warships, and we need to make our military stronger. We need resources for that. In addition, we need to have bases overseas because these ships use up an incredible amount of fuel. We can't just make it with the bases we have. We need refueling ports all across the world. And so in order to try to get those ports, we need to take over some places or at least imperialize. So America's goal is really trade and economic growth. But if we say, hey, we're going to take you over, or we're going to put a lot of emphasis on running your society for you, even if we don't take you over. Um, we really just don't want to look like the bad guy. We don't want to look like we're these evil, awful rulers. After all, we fought our we fought for our independence against Great Britain for the exact same reason. Remember, when we fought the American Revolution, we wanted to break away from the British because they were con too controlling. They were the imperial power over us. We didn't like that so much. So when we go about doing imperialism, we don't want to look like the bad guys. We don't want to look like the evil people trying to take everybody over. So we have to justify it. So when we justify our imperialism, we, we don't say, oh, we're taking you over for economic reasons so we can sell you stuff and take your raw materials and we need military bases. Instead, we talk about this idea of manifest destiny, this idea that God predestined the United States to to take over as much property as we wanted because we were better than everybody else. There was this firm belief in the cultural superiority of Americans and really Western Europeans in general over much of the rest of the world. We believed uh, because we were uh, mostly predominantly white and because mostly predominantly Christian uh, that it was our duty to go over and bring Christianity to the other nations in the world and to really get them in shape for their own good, not because we wanted anything from it, not because we wanted to take anybody over for economic reasons. No, 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 no. This was just all about saving people and helping people. If you remember from 
last year in world history, white man's burden. This is essentially what we're talking about. This idea that the rest of the world is uncivilized and the United States is civilized. And so we, we've got this idea that we should try to civilize the rest of the world. This is social Darwinism, this belief that um, we are born better than everybody else in, in a true world of free markets. It's dog eat dog world, survival of the fittest. And so that if we can't take over other people, we have the right to do so because we're bigger, better, and stronger than them. Of course, there's also this idea of racial superiority, this idea that we could try to civilize the inferior races, like you see in the cartoon. Um, basically, Uncle Sam is carrying um, uncivilized notice, the racism and the way the cartoons are drawn. Uh, Uncle Sam is uncivilizing uh, savages, per se. Of course, there's nothing wrong with the people in South America or Africa or any other part of the world, but this is our justification. We, we, we say we're not doing this because we want to benefit economically. We're doing this to, quote unquote, help save you. We're doing it because we're the good guys. Yeah, okay, whatever. But that's our justification at the time. So how did we actually do this? How did we actually imperialize? Well, in 1867, we decided that we wanted Alaska. Um, at the time, we actually purchased Alaska in what was known as Stewart's Folly. William Stewart, the Secretary of State at the time, thought that Alaska would be a good deal, and so he tried to buy it. Uh, this is the American reaction. That crazy fool is really what a lot of people said about, uh, about William Stewart at the time. They thought he was crazy. They called this steward's folly. They said, buying Alaska, there's nothing there. It's cold, frozen tundra. So when we bought Alaska from, uh, from the Russians, we paid $7.2 million at the time. That's about two cents an acre. I'd say we got quite the steal because it turns out Alaska is pretty useful. But at the time, people didn't look at it that way. People pitied the fool because they thought he wasn't too bright for buying Alaska thought it was a waste of money. Needless to say, we did, and so we owned Alaska. Uh, next, an island known as the Midway Islands, located in the Pacific, 1867. There was really nobody there. It was an unoccupied island. America basically takes over, and nobody really notices that we do because there's not much there, not many people are there. Technically, it's not our property, but for the most part, when we take it over, um, this is expanding our power. And then maybe one of the most significant, Hawaii in 1887. Uh, Hawaii at the time was an independent nation, uh, but Hawaii had a lot of things going for it. Uh, Hawaii had uh, a good port between the United States and Japan and China. So it was about halfway between the United States and Japan or China. So if we needed a place to land and redo our ships, if we needed a shipyard, we could build a shipyard there. Uh, so in 1887, we want to build the naval base there. To use as a refueling station and so that's the reason why we want Hawaii. Uh, of course there are other reasons as well but that's the big one. So Hawaii also had a lot of sugar plantations. Uh, at the time most of the plantation owners were selling their sugar to America and this is where things start to get tricky. In fact three quarters of the island's wealth came from selling sugar to the United States. Unfortunately for the plantation owners um, prior to 1890, uh, they were exempt from tariffs. That was a good thing. But then all of a sudden, William McKinley gets elected president. McKinley raises the tariffs on people. He wants to protect American goods. And so when that happens, there's, there's this huge problem because now all of a sudden it costs a whole lot more money to sell sugar, the primary plantation in Hawaii, to the United States. And so a lot of the plantation owners, they actually want to become part of the United States. They don't care one way or another. They just want to get rich, and they don't want to have to pay the tariff that McKinley put in place. So a lot of plantation owners are begging to become part of the United States. American business leaders um, basically talk to the king of Hawaii, and they convince him to amend the Hawaiian Constitution. And convince him, uh, basically, you're going to do it or you're going to get overthrown way. And so they do. Um, one of the things that he amends the Constitution to say is that you must own land to vote. And of course, only the rich and the wealthy owned land in Hawaii at the time. This is all good and fine and perfect until the Queen takes over. Queen? Queen. Liliuo Kalani. Yeah, she comes in and she says, uh, yeah, no, we're not going to do that. Everybody's going to get to vote. 
Uh, it's not just going to be the rich, wealthy landowners. Everybody in Hawaii gets to vote. That's what the nation is built on. And the United States doesn't take too kindly to this. So what they do is they basically send the military over. Uh, they send the military in, and the military overthrows the queen. Um, yeah, so much for being the good guys in all of this. And in the meantime, while we're in the process of taking over Hawaii, we give control to a guy named Stanford B. Dole. Now, if he sounds familiar, it's because he owns, I don't know, a major pineapple plantation at the time. Perhaps you've heard of the company Dole Fruits. Still one of the largest crops in Hawaii. Of course, uh, once he takes over, um, President McKinley, 1897, uh, will eventually say, yeah, you know what, United States is part of the American territory. We are taking it over. And most of the military leaders go along with it. Stanford B. Dole goes along with it. It's just sort of this one day the queen's in, the next day the queen's out. Hawaiians never really get to vote on things. America just takes it over because we have the right to do so, because we say we have the right to do so. Uh, some of the things we've did in our nation's history, not necessarily the most kind and respectable things. If you go to Hawaii today, there's still a lot of ill will against this, uh, especially from Native Hawaiians. Of course, eventually Hawaii will become a state, but not until 1959. That's another story for another day. But the short of it, we took over Hawaii because we wanted it. Now, we're also going to put into play the Monroe Doctrine. Remember, in 1823, we declare that Europe should stay the heck out of, um, out of the Americas, whether it be North and South America. We really didn't do much other than proclaim that, and nobody really challenged us on that until the late 1800s. And the first example we're going to look at is Chile. Uh, Chile, in the late 1890s, um, one of the things that happened is a, an American sailor was there. There was a mob in the city of Valparaiso. Uh, the American sailor gets killed. Really, it has nothing to do with the government of Chile, nothing to do with the people of Chile. Chances are, bad place at the wrong time. Uh, but unfortunately uh, for the Chileans, the United States forces Chile to claim responsibility forces Chile to say that it's their fault, and forces them to pay $75,000, a huge sum of money at the time, to the families. Now, is this right? Is this just? Nope, but we're going to flex our muscle saying, hey, we've got the right to rule over the Western Hemisphere, even if we don't officially take anybody over. The second example we're going to look at is Brazil. Uh, in the late 1800s, a similar thing happens in Brazil. There is a rebellion against the government of Brazil. Um, the current government, the people don't like them too much. They kind of want to overthrow the government, put their own people in charge. But the government, the one that nobody likes, it turns out that there's one person who likes them, and that is the American government, because the government is very friendly to American trade and very friendly to American imperialism. So when the Americans come in, the Americans will help crush the rebellion. The Americans will send in the Navy to protect the government that nobody really likes, uh, except, of course, America, because we make money off of it. So once again, America is flexing their muscle in the Western Hemisphere. Another example, Venezuela. In 1895, there is a dispute between Great Britain and Venezuela. They are fighting over who owns certain territories within the Western Hemisphere, certain territories in Venezuela. And the United States, in short, puts a lot of pressure on Great Britain and basically says, if you don't stay the heck out of this, we're going to get involved and we're going to go to war. Of course, Great Britain doesn't want to start a war with the United States. They probably maybe could have beaten us at the time. Our, our military, of course, is expanding and on the rise, but we're, we're still not what we are today. Uh, so it was kind of an, I wouldn't say an empty threat, but it wasn't necessarily the kind of threat that we would make today. But once again, America flexing their muscle in the Western Hemisphere. This is the Monroe Doctrine. Each time, America realizes that we can expand and nobody's going to stop us. Nobody's going to get in our way. All three of these examples, while none of them really significant, really show us that we have control over the Western Hemisphere. And that leads to our confidence expanding within the world. So we're going to stop here for today. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily the end because we're going to talk more about American imperialism, um, particularly with the Spanish-American War and some of the consequences of that. But that's another lesson for another day. For now, have a great evening, unless you're watching this in the morning, in which case, have a good morning.